只有六年，但是已经在诸多领域独占鳌头的企业。
it doesn't have to be a physical gateway. It can be your uh, company's intranet, like logging system. Um, a lot of people got really excited about this idea, and this is also a space that we're applying a face platform to. Uh, the last application I want to mention is like some of the retail space. Uh, people come in, a lot of requirements wants to know like where is my memberships. When they come in, we want to get notified so we can better service them to increase the uh, the customer experience. And Face Platform is a great application for that. So that's some background for the Face Platform. Um, some of you probably like we got a lot of news on face recognition or even on AI. A lot of things here seems not like super high tech because. Uh, Maybe some high school students nowadays can use some tools to build face recognition on their laptop. Uh, but all the things I have shown, the real challenge between them is actually the scale we work with. We're talking about like number of faces you you have to deal with, the number of devices, the number of cameras you are going to set up in your in your settings, and how many queries queries you're going to handle every single minute. Um, so. We actually worked on this for years, since 2014. Um, so for four years already. We have, in the past two years, um, won the uh, face identification contest, the organized by NIST. This is a very large database that consists of like faces from every uh, skin color. So it's not just Asian, not just your friends, but people around the world. Um, but it's really difficult to do that. So I want to use this example to say how we actually industrialize AI to achieve this goal. This is a brief history of how we actually achieve this uh, through time. So we started a project in uh, 2014. So this, this graph is showing the uh, false matching rate, uh, which is the probability of being wrong when the system tells two faces the same. So we started with uh, 1 over 200. That's probably the thing you can achieve by using off-shelf tools by now. But over the years, but one over 200 is way away from being practically usable in a lot of situations. Then we see deep learning come out around 2015. So we apply them, and we since then we see huge uh, change in the uh, error rate. So by now uh, we are prob we are. The probability of being wrong from the model is 1 over 3 billion. So think about it. That problem means when the system fails like two faces are the same, the probability of being wrong is non-existent. So that makes it really, really practical to use in a very large database, like for the global people. But we, I think this graph is like a, a journey of ourselves. But it's also like, reminds me a lot of like industrialized things we have been doing. So the way we engineer AI applications has been completely changed. So I was pressed by, I was on a TV show just a, a couple of months ago. I was pressed uh, for the questions, are the same software engineers building the same applications that we see today? Uh, my answer to that is actually not. Um, the, the job role of different engineers has been very, very uh, um, different by now. So, I look at my company, E2, we roughly have like different, different, uh, these different kind of uh, people. Um, and one thing, uh, besides the normal, the traditional job titles like engineer, we do have a sub product engineering, we have algorithm engineering that's engineer like data pipelines, like how we actually um, process video streams, etc. But we also have a huge amount of uh, researchers working on machine learning. Like they train models and they try different techniques and just to, to lower the error rate and improve the performance of the model. But they, they're another part of their job is actually to, to do data, to do more about data. How can we label more data? How can, how can we uh, clean more data? So we are building, constantly building a data labeling platform. So we're building a platform that can allow researchers to easily uh, specify what kind of data needs to be labeled. Uh, how are they going to control the quality of the data being labeled? And 
and how they can review instead of complex workflows to have those more structured data to be labeled by humans. And we also have a huge like data labeling centers to recruit like uh, college students and other workers providing more jobs for them to actually do more manual labeling work. Um, another role is data analyst. Uh, we interview a lot of data like students from the math department and they're trying to get machine learning uh, space. But I think that one of the things that often oversee is the importance of data analysts. Um, whether or not the result is, in, is significant or not is more than just like a few numbers. Uh, the results can be viewed from different perspectives. Sometimes like bad results means actually means something very important. It requires more detailed analysis. So here's a graph that we use to quite, quite like to understand the human face space. Uh, this graph is not right now choosing. It's actually representing the, uh, the distribution of face similarity. So here, um, you can't really see, but most people's similarity between two, two faces is around a score of 40. And towards 100, probably um, it goes down to zero very quickly. Uh, but in the end, uh, we, we know that, based on this statistic we got, is uh, there is probably one face in a billion that looks exactly like you. And those are very interesting numbers from those data analysis. It also helps us to actually understand how, how, what happens when a face is mapping to a high dimensional space. And it guides us a lot of uh, more complicated work about faces. So we're diving into a little bit of more on the product engineering. One of the two challenges we have encountered in applying uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning in the field is two, two sides. One is the computational resources they require. Uh, the second is the network bandwidth. Um, we constantly run into these two things. Right? So the models we build sometimes can be very big and it requires a lot more complex, expensive hardware devices or even GPU chips to actually do the computation. But the second thing is, if you don't do it on those expensive devices and send those data back, maybe to the cloud, you're going to consume a lot of network bandwidth. So we have to make really hard trade-offs. So here's an example, again using the face platform example. So doing a, uh, a face recognition, usually there's a lot of uh, steps. So first, when people, when a person enters the camera, you're going to see, you have to detect the face. And then you have to track the face. And then you filter out something that looks like a face, but it's not actually a face. And then you align the face with more uh, a better angle. And then there's also like determining qualities, extract features, etc. To the end, you gotta you based on the features you extracted, you do some retrievals or against a huge database of features. So that's roughly a pipeline that we have to go through when doing face recognition. But the choice you have to make is which part you want to do it on the server. Which part you want to do um, more on device, right? It's about usually. It's, sometimes it's about latency. Sometimes it's about cost. It's actually a very hard choice we have to make. And the more we work on this, and it's aligned. The more we realize that it actually aligns the IoT infrastructure that's also being applied everywhere nowadays. So you have two choices. You have three choices. One is you can do more computation on the device end, here which is the camera. So here I'm showing a uh, camera that's engineered by us, uh, E2. So we put a lot of uh, face recognition algorithm in the camera so we can do some relatively cheap, uh, re relatively cheap computation. So the, the previous slides we showed detections and, and uh, tracking, these computation can be cheaply done on the CPU. So we choose to do that on the camera end. But there's more complicated uh, computations. Uh, sometimes we choose to send them back to the server. So one of the benefits of like the cloud is that you get elastic computing. When some computer is not being used, it can be used for something else. That's really useful for reducing the cost. But sometimes people want latencies, right? They don't want to wait for uh, going to the cloud and back. The latency sometimes goes to 100 milliseconds or a second. 
So they want to do more things on the on local way, in a very fast way. So that's where the edge comes in. So here I'm showing a picture of uh, the, one of the edge nodes we have built at E2. Uh, it's relatively low cost, uh, but it kind of supports, it, it was able to, depends on situations, it is able to support like 10 cameras, like doing feature extraction, etc. Even some simple um, uh, retrieval task. And if, and so, but there's a choice. The flexibility is depends on the users. Whether you want more latencies or you want more uh, uh, cost, lower cost. So the second, uh, the, the last aspect of the industrialization is um, we need, we live, we all live in ecosystems. We all see all kinds of companies that are in the AI space. I see them as more like ecosystems. We need uh, partnerships in like toolkits, right? We have to these days we build machine learning models with TensorFlow, with Kafka, with PyTorch. We don't build them using raw code. Um, we have to train our models on specific hardware, like a the AI chips or like the NVIDIA's GPU chips. Um, the second collaborations that we need is from the cloud. We have to process huge amount of data. Those data sometimes has to be really carefully managed. So these are terms of technologies are out there already doing that for us. The last is the uh, IT communication technologies. Uh, they provide more um, like full spectrum support for the ecosystem, for their partnerships. They build different like 5G, 5G networks that can solve the network bandwidth in many situations. Um, I'm running out of time, but um, that's why we have a lot of collaborations with Huawei, Microsoft Azure, and NVIDIA. Um, we are also their top partners. So I haven't talked about commoditizations. I think one side of like the result, a byproduct of industrialization is actually commoditizations, right? Some things become commodities, and it no longer requires specialties to actually do it. So one, one of the areas we're commoditizing is actually cameras, right? Um, there are a lot of com camera companies out there. Right? They build different kind of cameras. Before AI comes in, they have built into different like intelligent functions into their cameras. But these days, those functions are no longer necessary because you can buy like like the, the E2 boxes to actually to do the computation on top of them, rather than relying on different kind of like different performance intelligent functions on the end. We can also apply like face recognition on all, all, all mobile phones, not just one phone. Right? Uh, the other, we are also commoditizing AI. So here are the two products we're showing here that's based by uh, us. One is we call it Face Atom, uh, the other is YouTube box. Um, Face Atom is more for a server. So if you buy those boxes or servers, you can develop face applications right away. Not just using, not using the off-shelf like toolkit to actually train our models, but they, they, they have uh, models already built for them. And through the Edge technology like Microsoft Edge Runtime, we can get models to onto, this device, onto those devices really easily. So actually what you get is like face recognition um, performance, like um, improving every year. But you can just, you don't have to worry about performance of those models, but you can develop applications against them. Um, the last, more bigger picture is what, what we're building on the cloud. So um, on the cloud, well, based on the uh, common cloud server, um, the uh, partnerships, we build more of uh, like AI applications on top of that to, pro to provide more functions for those cloud, but also to allow like our clients to actually build their things. Where if you build something on the cloud, you can try to use our APIs and our even devices to uh, integrate with your existing businesses. So with these like uh, things. I think the whole point is, um, with industrialization, makes things um, engineering faster. And commoditization allows these technologies to be spread further, so more and more people can actually apply them in their own businesses. Um, this way, I think, I think it works in circles, right? The more things get commoditized, and the more things get industrialized, and then circle again. I think this way is, is the way we vision that AI technologies could go further away in that super fast speed in the future. Okay, thank you.